Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. In this week's podcast, I have tidbits. I have a finished project. I have an update on a work in progress, and I have an update on my upcoming 1970s vintage project, which is part of my long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade from the 1890s to the 1990s. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, tap or mouse over the video playback area of your screen and use the chapter titles to guide you to the starting point of the desired section. Use the gear icon to slow down or speed up playback. So let's get started. In the past, I've shared a tidbit from an Irish TV show called Hands that focused on the lifestyle of rural people who raised sheep and spun the wool into yarn, which they then knit into socks. Well, recently, Liv Catherine posted in my Ravelry group a link to that video, but she also provided links to other videos from Hands. I thought Hands was a one-off film, but it was actually a TV series. The series covered various topics, but there were several others that had to do with wool and textiles. The series was apparently filmed in the 1970s and the 1980s. I'm going to leave links down in the show notes to those episodes that Liv Catherine shared. The first link will be about spinning and sock knitting, that video that I've shared in previous tidbits. The second link is for a compilation of episodes of the show Hands, but the link will take you directly to the section that is about traditional Donegal weaving and sheep farming. And then the third link is about making traditional spinning wheels. I hope you enjoy. Before I learned to spin, I was fascinated by videos of how wool is processed in mills in order to create yarn. After I learned to spin, I revisited many of those videos and then looked for more of them. I had more context for what was going on at each stage because it usually related to something I would do during the course of preparing raw fleece into something that I could spin. But not everything that is done by hand in one way is exactly replicated by a machine in those mills. So I have found it difficult sometimes to understand certain aspects of machine milled fiber prep versus prep done by hand. Most mills will either do woolen spun yarn or worsted spun yarns. So it's hard to understand how the two processes are the same and different. My husband sent me a nicely animated video on how merino wool is graded and processed for worsted spinning versus woolen spun yarns. It's just three minutes long, but it is packed with really good information. And when I say it's packed, I mean, it is information dense. (laughs) I'll leave a link down in the show notes for that. This tidbit came to me from Allison on Twitter. It's a short article about a program available to New England schools called Wool in Schools. So Wool in Schools is a traveling educational wool program aimed at school children. It's part of the global campaign for wool initiative that the Prince of Wales spearheads. I did a little digging to find out more about the program and found the organization's website, which I will link to down below. As they explain it, We have two converted shipping containers traveling to primary, intermediate, and secondary schools across the North and South Islands of New Zealand. Our mobile wool sheds travel the length of New Zealand teaching our children about the wonders of wool. Kids learn about wool processes, innovative thinking, design, and technology, and they'll have lots of fun along the way. These containers spend one to two weeks with each school during term time. There are lots of downloadable information sheets on the website that are meant to be either worksheets or just information for school children, um, as well as educational activities that are related to wool, in particular, New Zealand wool. So even though I lived in New Zealand for a couple of years after I learned to knit back in the 80s, and I learned a bit about New Zealand sheep while I was there, there was and still is 
plenty that I don't know and didn't know. And so I was really delighted that the information in those handouts that are aimed at school children actually taught me quite a few things that I didn't know about the New Zealand wool industry. So as always, I will leave a link to the article that Allison sent to me as well as to the Wool in Schools website. So I finished a project earlier this week, which was the socks that I had picked up again last week on when we went on our road trip. So I wanna to go to the overhead and show you the results and talk through the techniques that I use at different stages of uh, the sock. So let's go to the overhead. Last week I was showing you the first knee sock of this pair that was completed and I explained how I do the calf shaping for a knee sock. For a sock that ends here, uh, most of the time you don't need to do any shaping. Some people do, some people's legs start getting um, larger pretty quickly, right, in, right from the, the ankle going up. Um, but for me, mine's pretty straight, and so I only need to start doing shaping if I'm going to do a knee sock like this. So last week I talked about how I do that shaping, how I plan it out, how I figure out the stitch counts, that sort of thing. So I'll link to that casual Friday episode up here and also down in the show notes. Uh, what I want to go through today because I finished the sock is just go through the techniques that I use at different points. I typically don't use a sock pattern when I'm knitting a plain sock like this. Instead I take the the measurements that I need in order to get a sock that's going to fit the specific person I'm knitting for. And so I combine that with my gauge to understand how many stitches I'm going to need. And then when I pick the heel, I pay attention to what sorts of modifications I might need to make to the heel in order for it to fit that person. So I have a, a pretty large heel diagonal, so I need to make sure that the edge of the sock will go around and I need to make sure it's not too tight around here. So I'm gonna go through the different techniques I used at different points, and then I'll uh, link to videos on those particular techniques. This sock was knit toe up. It's one of the rare circumstances where I actually did want to use all of the yarn in the skein. Um, and then some, I also purchased a mini skein of coordinating color so that I could do the heels and then also uh, the cuff at the top. Uh, some people would have also done the toes that way, so I really didn't know how uh, the yarn was going to play out, which is why I started with just the striping yarn at the toe. So for this, I used a closed cast on. There's a few different choices for that. I used Judy's Magic cast on, but there's also a Turkish cast on or figure eight cast on that, that some people use. Uh, then the type of toe is called a wedge toe. It's the really classic toe shape for socks, but it's done in the, in the toe up orientation. And then because I have a large heel diagonal and I wanted to use a short row heel, I knew that I was going to need a gusset. So a gusset is a little sort of triangular piece of fabric that enters in at a point where a piece of clothing is going to change direction. So you might see them at um, the crotch or you might see them at an underarm, um, but you'll also see them oftentimes in socks because these have to turn a corner. And so because I need more room here, I need to increase the number of stitches. I knew that I was going to need eight additional stitches on the needles when I started the sock heel in order for the heel to be deep enough. And I know that because there is a way to sort of calculate that. I have a video that explains that up here and I'll link to it down below. And uh, I'll also include information about which method I used in the video. There's three methods in the video. I used method number two which was to create this gusset in the stitches. And you can do this, this works in either direction. I often do this for uh, cuff down socks again. So I would start uh, prior to the heel, I would do my increases. So I knew, knew that I needed eight increases. I also knew how long the heel would be, how many rows the heel would be when I started to turn. So I use that information in order to know when uh, to start doing those gussets. I have a video on this process about how do you know when to start the heel of a toe up sock. And it's not just um, aimed at this type of heel, it's, it's really aimed at any type of heel. And then the, the actual heel I knit is called an hourglass heel. 
a lot of people just call it a short row heel and it's called an hourglass heel because the first half of the heel uh, gets gradually narrower and narrower and the second half gets wider and wider so if you were to lay this flat it would look like a, an hourglass and so then the type of short rows that I use are German short rows. So I did a video on how to use German short, how to do a, a German short row sock heel three different ways, which again, I'll link to above and below. And I used method two, which is to short row the first half of the heel without doing the longest short rows. So you're only short rowing in between those. So you, you don't do short rows in the, la in the first and last until you get up to the center and then you work back and forth across all of those stitches. You do your short rows in the first and last and then you come back to the, the middle and you work your the second half of the heel. Again, I've got this uh, in videos in a video that I will link to. So once I'm ready to go up the leg, I need to decrease out those extra stitches because my uh, ball of foot and my ankle are close enough together that the that I need those to be the same circumference. So I worked my decreases and then I worked the leg until it was time for me to start the calf increases. There's another technique that I used at the transition between the self-striping yarn here and the ribbing. Uh, when you change colors, and you have purl stitches on the right side of the work, often you'll see these little blips um, in the purl stitches, the first set of purl stitches. So the first round when I was connecting the new color, I just worked in stockinette. And so that took this last row of, of self-striping yarn that was on the needles, it took them off the needles in stockinette. And then I was ready to start my ribbing. And I'll leave a link, to, I have a video on avoiding pearl blips or using them as you want. So the, what I'm talking about with the blips are these, these little things that you see on the wrong side of this particular sock. So I worked in my knit two, pearl two ribbing until I got to the bind off. And because I knew this was going to be flipped over, uh, I use a, a bind off method. It's a type of sewn bind off called the half hitch bind off. And it creates an edge that looks like a long tail cast on. Sewn bind offs give, give you, allow you to control the amount of stretch in the edge. And so that's what I like to use. And I tend to like a long tail cast on when I cast on. And so uh, I wanted that. And I wanted that part to show when this was flipped over rather than seeing the bumpy part of the bind off. So the half hitch bind off, I'll link to up here and below. So I think, I think that's about it. So those are the techniques that I used uh, in this particular sock. So I do have a written tutorial called the August Sock Knit Along that I wrote, was, I think maybe three years ago at this point. And that tutorial is for cuff down socks. Um, but it does go into all of the measurements that you need to need that you need to take for a regular sock, not necessarily for a knee sock, and how you can tell where the sock formula is going to fall down for your foot, like where you're going to need to make modifications. And it has a number of different heels and how to make those modifications, including short row heels. And it has links to all sorts of videos that I've done on socks. You can get a lot of information about how to uh, fit a sock to your foot from that uh, tutorial, even if your intent is to knit toe up. I also have done several videos on the toe up versions of several popular types of sock toes. And uh, then many of the heels are reversible. You can do them in either direction. So if that's something that you are interested in, it's just understanding how uh, the sock formula works and, and how to measure your foot and how you can adjust a, a sock in order to give you a better fit. Um, the August sock knit along might be something that would be helpful. I have been asked a number of times to do a similar tutorial for toe up socks. And I do have it on my list, my long list of things that I plan to do at some point. Uh, I just probably isn't going to be any time in the immediate future, maybe something that I would do for next year. I have just a quick update on the sweater I've been reverse engineering. I kind of put it to the side for a couple of weeks while we went on our road trip and then I was finishing up that, uh, those knee socks. 
So I have sewn in the sleeves into the sweater. One of the sleeves, I think it's this one, uh, hasn't been washed yet, so it's a little bit stiff. So the, the fit around the armholes is a little funky, um, but I tried on the original sweater and I'm like it's basically, it fits the same way and I kind of knew it was going to do that. Um, so what I have, um, and I wanted to kind of get a sense, I knew that the sleeves are going to be a little bit short and I wasn't sure how much. And so they're about an inch short. So uh, I haven't 100% decided what I'm going to do, but I think what I'm going to do, I want for sure I'm going to take the cuff out and then re-knit the cuff uh, top down. And I might just do it for two inches or I might do it for four inches so that it can flip back. I was getting the opinion from my daughter who is in town right now about whether I should um, do a bind off that was an I-cord bind off with the red that I'm using for um, the pockets because uh, they would kind of be next to each other and she's got very good taste and she was of the opinion that I shouldn't do that um, and just let the pockets um, give the impact on their own. So I'm kind of leaning toward her advice. The last thing I need to do still is the, the button band. It's the brioche button band. Uh, my intention had been to get that started this week and then do some testing of buttonholes on my sewing machine because that was something that I wanted to try with this sweater. But I got caught up in some other things that were uh, pretty exciting for me um, knitting wise that I will be talking about in just a few minutes. And it's the middle of summer. It's going to be 93 degrees today um, and it's hard <laughs> for me <laughs> to deal with this on my lap at this point because of the, of the wool and it's just kind of hot and I won't be able to wear it anytime soon. So. I'm dragging my heels a little bit on this one, but it's coming along. For the past few weeks, I've been planning my next project for my long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade from the 1890s to the 1990s. That project is going to be a 1970s sweater. A couple of years ago, when I was still in the earliest stages of the long-term project, I realized that if and when I did a 1970s sweater, I'd want to design one myself that used Elizabeth Zimmerman's percentage system, or EPS and that I would use stitch patterns from Barbara Walker's treasuries of knitting patterns within that design. Both women had a profound influence on how we knit today and both published their books in the 1970s. In addition to her treasuries, Walker had published Knitting from the Top, which outlines a number of different types of garments that could be knit seamlessly from the top down rather than what was convention at the time, which was to knit bottom up flat in pieces and seam. Zimmerman hated purling, so her designs tended to be stockinette based, seamless circular construction, or they were garter stitch knit flat and then potentially seamed. She really liked stranded color work. Now Walker didn't mind purling. Her treasuries are full of textured stitch patterns, but it does look like she wanted to avoid seaming if she could. And she found stranded color work patterns to be uninteresting because it was all stockinette based. The color work stitch patterns in her treasuries are all textured color work or slip stitch patterns. She even wrote an entire book on mosaic knitting. When I make decisions about what sweater I want to knit for this long-term project, I'm looking for interesting construction methods, particularly construction techniques I haven't seen before and which might be done quite differently than today. Mostly though, I'm interested in learning something new and then connecting the dots between the past and the present when it comes to construction and techniques. One of the reasons I decided to knit an Elizabeth Zimmerman sweater is because I was already familiar with Walker's top-down method. In her book, 
she describes two different ways of knitting a seamless set-in sleeve. Now, I love me a set-in sleeve, and I've used both of Walker's methods numerous times, usually using a more refined method than what she presented first back in 1970-71. Most of the sweaters I have knit for this long-term project have had a set-in sleeve, and one of the really interesting things to observe is how those sleeves are constructed and shaped in different ways as the sweater evolved and fashions changed. So the sweater that I selected from Knitting Without Tears was a Norwegian style sweater with stranded color work and armholes formed by steeks. It's a very simple drop shoulder sweater design. Last week I was debating about modifying the sweater shape for a better fit by making it a modified drop sleeve with a shaped neck and shaped shoulders. So these modifications are absolutely elements that Elizabeth Zimmerman included in her patterns and materials at some point, but I wasn't sure when. I knew I would like the fit of that sweater with that shaping more than the original, but I was torn about whether to just go with that basic version or not. I just wasn't sure if those refinements were ones that Elizabeth Zimmerman had made um, by the end of the 1970s. I got an overwhelming number of comments encouraging me to go with Elizabeth Zimmerman's original design because that that would be more in keeping with my goal to understand the evolution of the sweater and to see where EPS actually began. So those comments helped me in a couple of ways. So thank you to everyone who, who left a comment. First, I realized I hadn't done a good job communicating what EPS was, or that Knitting Without Tears contains, I think, five different sweater styles in it. The reason I had chosen the Norwegian one was because of the steaks. This was not a 1970 design, it was a 1955 design, it was her first. The proportions of that one are so simple that there is absolutely no mystery about how that sweater will fit and where the fit problems are going to be. And there will be fit problems. For Elizabeth Zimmerman, that sweater was not about establishing EPS so much as it was about turning a Norwegian sweater inside out and the revelation she had about the existence of steeks. Essentially, she reverse engineered our Norwegian sweater and learned that she could work stranded color work um, without ever having to purl. In my mind, that sweater is not really a fair way to evaluate EPS. Now, the other designs I was familiar with in Knitting Without Tears were, I thought, all circular yoke constructions of one kind or another. When I realized that I hadn't been communicating very well what EPS was, I flipped back through the sweaters in the book again, and then I saw something that I either hadn't seen before in this book or that just didn't register with me. I'm, I'm not really sure. So let's go to the overhead and I'll show you what I found that has completely changed my plans. So this is the sweater that I have been talking about doing for the past couple of months, a ski sweater in color pattern. So it's a stranded color work sweater that has steaks to open up the armholes. So the steaks were the one new technique that I was interested in learning about. I didn't find much else interesting about this particular sweater because it's a simple drop shoulder design with no shaping in the shoulders, uh, a, a boat neck. Not, I wasn't really excited about it uh, at all. So she's got chapter four. She's got one on seamless sweaters. So Elizabeth Zimmerman really disliked purling and she really preferred being able to, to knit every stitch if she could get away with it. So what she did was figure out how to get the same shaping that you would see in a pieced sweater and figure out how to get that um, by knitting seamlessly. So she has a few sweaters and so she still is using her system of percentages in order to establish circumferences. What she has figured out in these is then how do you do that shaping? One of the sweaters is a circular a yoke sweater 
and she so she designed this originally back in the early 60s I believe and she recognized that yoke sweaters when you just knit in a circle they aren't going to fit well in the front and the back um, because you don't have any shaping which is the problem with that Norwegian sweater there's no shaping to lift the back of the neck and she understood that doing some short row shaping at the back of the neck uh, to raise it would also then lower the front and it would make it fit more comfortably. I don't particularly like yoke sweaters, so that wasn't interesting to me and there's no steaks. So what else does she have in here? She has the traditional raglan. Now this one, she was always knitting bottom up uh, typically in those days. And so she figured out how to do all this raglan shaping in a seamless construction. Now she didn't invent this idea. She probably unvented it as she would call it. She figured it out on her own. I have a book from the 1930s that describes how to knit a top-down seamless raglan on circular needles. So she didn't invent this, but she did figure it out on her own. So that was another um, method that she figured out. And then she's got this one right here, which intrigues me. I am interested in this. It's a saddle shoulder sweater. And so that has some interesting shaping. I have done saddle shoulders before, but not using this construction. So that was is interesting to me, but again, this is a seamless sweater where you're knitting all of the pieces uh, from the armholes up, at, you're knitting everything together. It's a, it's a type of yoke sweater. It's just that this one has saddle shoulders. Any of those, of these three seamless sweaters would have allowed me to use Barbara Walker's treasuries, but I wouldn't have really learned that much. I would have learned a little bit with this, but then I would have forfeited the steaks. You keep going and she's got chapter five, other knitted garments. And then I see the kangaroo pouch sweater. And I thought, wait a second, somebody in the comments mentioned the kangaroo pouch sweater a week or two ago. And for some reason, I just thought the wonderful wallaby, which was a bottom up seamless raglan that has a, it's like a sweatshirt style pocket where your hands can touch in the middle. It's like a little pouch type of thing. And so for some reason, when that person commented that, I was thinking wonderful wallaby, and when I saw this, I thought, oh, I wonder if she, if that's what this is, is something to do with that. But then I read the first paragraph. This design emerged in response to a plea for a circular sweater with set in sleeves. And so then I thought, well, that, that's more interesting to me because I prefer set in sleeves and most of the sweaters that I have knit for my long-term project have had set in sleeves and every one of them has been different in some way, either the shaping or the direction of knitting, the construction of it. There was something different about every one of them. And that has been really interesting to see. So my assumption was that she figured out how to do this yoke thing. And then she figured out, oh, I can just keep the armholes straight and then just decrease on the sleeve side in order to get that that shaping because that is a style of, that is a way of doing a set in sleeve seamlessly um, bottom up but and I thought well maybe she was the person who came up with that because Barbara Walker figured out how to do that top down and so I kept reading and I turned the corner and I saw this picture and I thought wait a second, what's going on here? And so this is, these are the st stitches for the underarm and the, the upper body above the underarm is, is knit in the round. Um, you do cast on a couple of extra stitches to facilitate the steek, but it has steeks. So I thought, well, that's, that's really cool. That would give me steeks. It doesn't have to be stranded color work. And then I, I, I went on to, but then I realized, well, this is not the way I thought she was going to be doing the set and sleeve. And I read the instructions and I thought, this is amazing. I got so excited immediately because it's something I haven't seen before 
uh, which is something I love in these long-term project sweaters is to come across something I haven't seen before and that you don't really see nowadays. You'll see other variations, but you won't see that particular version. And so this is a simulation of once the armhole has been cut open and you pick up stitches all the way around. So this, this edge right here is, you can just pretend that it's, it's attached to the body of the sweater. And so the sleeve is knit top down. So the body was knit bottom up, but the sleeves are being a knit top down. And she has you knit for about an inch on all of the stitches. And then she basically has you work something that's very similar to a heel turn, a sock heel turn. There's a, more stitches at the base, but you're basically working a sock heel turn in order to get down to the number of stitches that you actually need um, for, for your sleeve. So whatever you want to go for your sleeve for, for the rest of the way. And I just thought this is so amazing. And she mentions you can do something clever in this one inch space because one of the things that I was imagining and is true is that you, you can see these turns here. You can see what they look like. They kind of define things a bit. And I immediately thought, well, if you did something like seed stitch along here, then those turns are not going to be very visible because you're going to have a combination of knits and pearls and that will be lined up as an edge against it and it would probably look uh, pretty nice. And so I got very excited about this, but also when I saw that she said in her original newsletter, which you can see in the Opinionated Knitter, it was published, I think, in about 1968 uh, when she developed this particular sleeve. And she mentioned that you're basically doing a sock heel turn. That gave me a sort of an aha moment for Barbara Walker uh, came up with two methods of doing set in sleeves in a seamless sweater. Um, and one of them was to pick up stitches and do shaping, uh, short row shaping on it and to work, to work the sleeve in a downward fashion. Um, and the other one was to knit those sleeves simultaneously with the rest of the body, just like you would for a circular yoke or raglan. It's just the position and where those increases are. So Barbara Walker and Elizabeth Zimmerman were coming up with these ideas at the same time and they knew each other and it, and they've even, you know, they would correspond with each other. And, um, I believe Barbara Walker wrote the foreword of one of, um, Elizabeth Zimmerman's books or introduction, uh, as well. And so to me, it, it seems like it would have been a fascinating thing to watch uh, Barbara Walker and Elizabeth Zimmerman feed off of each other's creativity and sort of knitting engineering ability. So as you may have gathered, I'm pretty excited about the kangaroo pouch sweater because it gives me seven sleeves, allows me to apply stitch patterns from Walker's treasuries, uses steaks, and uses EPS. Also, there is shoulder shaping, which is described in a really interesting way, and it's not one I've seen before. One of the things that I have learned about myself during the course of this long-term project is exactly how often <laughs> I ask a question that I just have to know the answer to, and I have no plans for what I'm gonna do with that answer. There's not a reason why I need to know that answer. I just want to know the answer. So the proj this project began with me asking a question of, Geez, I wonder if knitting patterns were published in the newspapers 100 to 150 years ago. No reason, they're just curious. But getting that answer and then ending up with three more questions and then more questions and realizing that what I thought I knew about knitting and sweater knitting at that, that time in history, uh, none of what I thought was true actually was true, uh, which then led to more questions and then led to this project. Uh, evolving. And it took a couple of months before I even realized I was starting a long-term project. <laughs> uh, I, I was just trying to, again, answer a specific question and knitting the sweater in order to answer it. So sometimes I can't find the answers to my questions um, or I get stuck. And that was the case last week when I was 
struggling with this Norwegian sweater. I really wasn't happy with the original uh, shaped one I, because I, I knew what the result was going to be like and I wasn't going to be happy with it. Uh, and then looking at the one that I knew was going to be happy and then just not feeling happy with my choices. So getting so much feedback from people that said, go with the original because it's in keeping with your goals for your long-term project. And by hearing that over and over again, I realized I need to think about what are the goals for my long-term project and does that sweater in any form actually help me with that? Uh, and that was what then led me to go back into the book and to rediscover that kangaroo pouch sweater, which I must have seen years ago and then gone, why would you need to do that? You know, like. I probably just dismissed it because I had so many other ways of solving the problem that that sweater is solving um, that I didn't need to do that. But now I see the value in doing that and it's making me a lot more excited and it allows me to do so much more that is in keeping with my, my bigger goal. So asking those questions without knowing uh, what the answer is going to be or what I'm going to do with that answer. It seems to be the key <laughs> to this entire project. And I thank all of you who uh, commented uh, in the comments last week. Really appreciate it. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.